the basis for this is, you know, we're often asked conversationally when we meet people who might not be scientists, so what do you study? And uh, very often, if they're not scientists, they want to know something that's clinically relevant. And uh, depending on my mood that day, I either tell them I do cell biology, and one of my neighbors, after all, all New York is the as a financial center, said, well, how do you sell biology? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and so, uh, so then I knew I had a, uh, a sales job to do, in fact, and uh, I tried to explain to him uh, what cell biology actually was. Uh, other times, as, as I'll allude to briefly, we work on a range of diseases, and so I can give almost any answer I feel like at that particular day. And the reason is that it all stems from basic cell biology studies, and then we've uh, veered off into various areas. And what I'm going to try to do in this talk is to go through some of these things about career development and mentoring and illustrate from my own career how these, um, how these developed and how these led to transitions in my, in my, in my life and, and my work. And uh, I think uh, many of these are things that we've heard from uh, at the start. Uh, one is that things will change a lot during your career. So I've I, I started graduate school in the early 1970s, and I'll give you some examples of how things changed since then. And the, the point is that the, the, same, the rate of change is, if anything, getting faster. So when I talk about fold changes, you should probably double it or uh, add an order of magnitude or something. I actually found uh, this was very important for me, that being multidisciplinary, I trained as a chemist, and I uh, jumped into a cell biology lab uh, for a postdoc having no formal biology training beyond uh, the age of 14. Um, I think it's important to go in depth, but uh, don't be afraid to jump into new areas. And, and as you're doing re research, keep your eyes open for opportunities that you didn't expect. I think an important thing that some people have discussed is as you're starting your career, you want to pick an area of research that you think is going to have, uh, is going to develop and grow in a major way uh, over the next uh, decades. And related to that, you want to invest early in developing new technologies and areas of research. Um, people have spoken about this. I think it's so important. You have to love what you do. If you're going to be a successful scientist, this is not, as we all know, a nine to five job. And so you have to love what you do and do what you love. And also, uh, as many have expressed, the people who work for you are your most important resource. And this is something that I didn't hear a lot about, but I think it's so true. You have to tell the people in your lab that it's a, you have a hypothesis, so you're testing a hypothesis. Actually, the best thing that they can do is to tell you that your hypothesis is baloney and that they have proven that that hypothesis is not correct. So often, young workers want to say, oh, I want to support the hypothesis of my mentor, and I, if the experiment doesn't verify the hypothesis, it means the experiment didn't work. Well, that's not true. Actually, hypo hypothesis uh, 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 you know, disproving the hypothesis is often the most important thing that you can do. Now, uh, so here's where I started. I actually started in a protein structure and, and a theoretical lab. And when I say this was very early bioinformatics, I did an experimental result that showed that glutamic acid was not very good, not particularly good at forming alpha helices in model polymers. And the theoreticians in the group said, I must be a bad experimentalist because in proteins, glutamic acid was most likely of any residue to be in a, found in an alpha helix. And so I was curious about that. And I went, actually at the time, you could manually go through the entire database of unique proteins with solved structures. There were 24 of them. And you could go through manually through the sequence. And so this, uh, as I call bioinformatics paper, actually meant going through and finding every glutamate and seeing the three or four residues down the chain, there either was or was not a positive charge. And the ones where there was a positive charge were the ones on, on the average in helices, and the ones not were indifferent as helix formers. And so, uh, so this was uh, informatics, this was manual informatics. You could go through the whole protein database by hand in, uh, in 1975. Uh, four years later, uh, we were uh, looking then at all the structures that were known along with all the sequences of homologous proteins. This we didn't do by hand, but we, uh, we used this to improve statistics of understanding pairwise interactions uh, of amino acids in 
uh, in proteins and the effect on conformational studies. I loved doing that stuff at the time, but according to one of my criteria, you had to think about something that at the time you thought had legs. And my conclusion was that protein folding in a computer in the mid-1970s was premature. It, uh, over the course of a lifetime, you could guess from Moore's Law uh, or things like that, that computers would become powerful enough to do this. But the tenure clock is six years, not a lifetime. And I really thought that this was not going to be a good way to uh, establish a career in science. And so I, I, I did a um, headfirst jump into cell biology. I went to a cell biology lab where they knew as little physical chemistry as I did cell biology. But uh, we had some great collaborators. It was the lab of Ira Pasten at the NIH. Uh, Yossi Schlesinger was a, a colleague in the lab at the time. And what I found was that uh, because I love to work with uh, instruments, and that was one of the things that I learned as a biophysical chemist, that I could use the first generation of image intensifier video cameras on microscopes. And it turned out that then you could make very simple observations and get them published in, uh, in, in, uh, in high impact journals. So uh, this really then led to a, 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 a career uh, change to study endocytic trafficking. And uh, this was a, uh, actually a, a, little, from a little, little article. It shows you how simple graphics were in the early 1980s, right? Uh, and this was uh, illustrating uh, one of the things that we had found in the lab, which was that endosomes became acidified. And this was important. Here's uh, Ari Hellenius's Semliki forest virus, if you can see it, getting into these acidified endosomes and that allowing the nuclear capsid to go out. Similarly, diphtheria toxin takes advantage of this. Other viruses like influenza take advantage of this. And receptors, and this was one that we uh, actually have studied now for Ever since then, the low-density lipoprotein binding to its receptor dissociates at this uh, low pH, and that allows the receptor to recycle while the uh, lipoproteins go to uh, lysosomes and are degraded. Now, here's something that is not in the papers. This is a sort of pH map that we made of cells showing the pH of different endocytic organelles. But when we first did this experiment, our intention was not to measure the pH of endosomes and lysosomes. Our, our intention was actually to use uh, fluorescence energy transfer to measure receptor dimerization related to uh, signaling mechanisms. And we knew that these would get endocytosed, and we didn't know uh, what the, fluores the donor fluorophore was fluorescein, which we knew was pH sensitive. So it was important for us that the endosomes not be acidic because that would quench the fluorescein fluorescence and would invalidate the ability to do the experiments we wanted to do. Uh, so the student who was doing this project said, well, you know, we ought to do this control and just make sure that they're still at neutral pH. And I'll never forget, he called me up at about 9.30 at night. This is when you didn't have internet and so on. And he said, well, I did the experiment. The result is very clear. The endosomes are acidic, so the project is a failure. And so, I, so and that, I went to bed and I thought, wait, wait a minute, okay, so we're not going to study EGF signaling, but maybe there's something important to do here. And that's, that's what I mean by, uh, by keeping your eyes open and letting your students contradict you. He didn't keep going until he could finally find conditions where the fluorescein didn't get quenched. Uh, we actually had to say, okay, maybe this is important. It's, it's a good reason to do quantitative imaging and to worry about controls. And uh, turns out that five, we were lucky because I know five or six other labs, major labs, that tried to do the same energy transfer experiment we were trying to do. And again, this was 10 years premature with the instruments available at the time. You could have never done it. The signal to noise was too poor. OK, so uh, moving along with these uh, ideas of looking then at endocytic membrane trafficking. Uh, we started to map out the uh, pathways. As I mentioned, there were various effects of acidification, which we then, uh, once we knew it occurred, we decided to study it in some detail. We also, be and this was related to my training as a physical chemist, uh, everything we did, we wanted to quantify, we wanted to measure kinetics and efficiencies of these various uh, processes. And one of the things that we noticed was that if we took two ligands, transferrin and LDL, they would initially go into the same endosomes, but within about two to four minutes, the uh, transferrin would get sorted away from the LDL, 
And uh, again, we could quantify this. We could see that the LDL was accumulating about 30-fold in, in brightness in these uh, early endosomes, and the transferrin was accumulating about three or four-fold. This led to a model of sorting in which we predicted that the geometry of this organelle with this narrow diameter tubule budding out of it might allow for selective pulling out of membrane components while solubilized components would remain in the more vacuolar part of the compartment. And we wanted to test this hypothesis because these sorts of default trafficking pathways are, are not particularly popular in the field. And so we modified, say, the cytoplasmic domain of the transferrin receptor. We showed it uh, affected endocytic rates but didn't affect recycling rates. We modified the, ex ec the ectodomain and, uh, and didn't find effects. But in the end, you, you can't modify simultaneously the ectodomain, the transmembrane domain, and the cy cytoplasmic domain. And people would always say, oh, there's a protein-protein interaction that's important for pulling these out into the recycling pathway. And so the, um, the way around that was to uh, forget about proteins and to use a lipid analog and say, let's see if the lipid, once it gets into the endosomes, recycles with the same rate as the transferrin. And I was very fortunate at the time to recruit a young uh, graduate student, PhD student, who was just finishing his degree at uh, Rockefeller University in New York. Uh, uh, some of you know him, G2 Mayer. And, uh, and this is an experiment of G2s where he showed that the trans tracking of transferrin and uh, this lipid analog were exactly the same. And again, not only did we do this morphologically, as I just showed you, but uh, kinetically, we could show that the kinetics of these two pot, uh, uh, molecules moving into these compartments were identical. And I just wanted to say, this is one of these things that I, I realized at the time, doing these kinetic experiments at the time required very intricate uh, choreography of pipetting, rinsing, uh, fixing, and everything else. And what G2 would do on the days that they were doing these experiments was he would get about five people in the lab all together at different stations working to do this whole thing. And so even at that time, uh, G2 was, uh, was really good at organizing teams and delegating responsibility to, to various individuals. And when I mentioned this to people at NCBS, they said I should be sure to say that here. Uh, so, uh, and in fact, quantitatively at all steps, this, this in fact did verify this idea that the lipids could transport at the exact same way as the, um, as the transferrin receptor did. So a few more years go on. We, we did other kinetic measurements. We looked at a lot of other ligands. We started to get these really uh, complex signaling pathways with a lot of these kinetic measurements made. And other people in, uh, in a number of labs around the world were identifying the specific proteins that were required at every one of these individual steps. And there were different groups of these proteins involved at every one of these steps. And it was getting really complicated. And I started to feel like this. Okay, so that, that you can't see the bottom. It says, I'll pause for a moment so you can let this information sink in. And um, this is what I started to feel like going into the lab, working on some of these aspects of membrane trafficking that you could uh, look at, uh, you know, one more of these proteins and, not, and knock it out, modify it, look at the changes in rates. It was really complicated. And honestly, this reminded me that at heart I was a physical chemist. I was looking for uh, relatively simple general principles in biology, and I really felt like I was getting bogged down in details and looking for trends in uh, relatively small changes. And so this came back to this principle that I said, do what you love. I realized at a certain point, this, these things are extremely important. I don't mean to, to in any way say that they're not. And I admire the people that can put together this kind of work and do the biochemistry uh, and the reconstitution experiments to show these kinds of things. I, 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 I have utmost respect, and I'm just amazed by it. I just also know that I couldn't do it myself. I just, it just doesn't get me excited in the way that you need to be excited when you go in, into your lab and, uh, and, and do your work. So started to think about various other things, and one was we had been using this LDL receptor 
as a, a, a probe because it was the brightest fluorescent ligand we could make to add to the cells. You could fill this thing with fluorescent dyes and, 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 and it was one of the first molecules that you could actually do single particle tracking on the surface of cells with, for example. And we said, well, you know, this is not only a good probe for cell biological studies, but actually it it's an important biological molecule. And one of the important things it does is it carries sterol into cells. And it turns out that nobody really knew how sterol moved around in a cell. And so this appealed to me as a very generally important problem that we might be able to apply some of the things that we like to do. <coughs> Excuse me. Especially because we had developed some fluorescent sterols that we could use uh, to look at membrane trafficking. And I don't have time to go into this, but we, uh, we've been now looking at the mechanisms of intracellular non-vesicular sterile transport. And we've actually been focusing on this one protein, which we selected for a variety of reasons. Again, doing quantitative studies of sterile transport, we've been able to now see that this protein is responsible for about one third of intracellular transport uh, non-vesicular transport in cells, and it, which uh, amounts to about 25% of total vis intracellular uh, vesicle, vesicular transport. I'm going to tell you about one, one uh, I think, think, very interesting result and just show you, in, in a way, how this brings part of my career around in, in full cycle. So uh, in addition to studying this protein in cells, we developed a liposome assay to look for the uh, transfer of a fluorescent sterol from a donor liposome to an acceptor liposome. And this is the fluorescent sterol analog that we used. And one of the things that we were interested in, because other groups had found that phosphoinositides uh, were affecting the ability of other sterol transporters to move sterol around in the cells, and as you know, there are different phosphoinositides on various organelles, and these are essentially organelle identity markers. And so uh, <coughs> a graduate student in the lab in, in this reconstituted assay said, OK, let's put a few percent of the various phosphoinositides into either the donor or the acceptor lipid membrane and see what happens. And it's pretty remarkable. So if we have no phosphoinositides, we get about seven molecules of, uh, of sterile transferred per molecule of star 4 per minute. And if we put uh, PI35P2 in the donor membrane, that doesn't change significantly. But if we put it in the acceptor membrane, it, ampli it amplifies the rate almost tenfold. And conversely, if we put PI45P2, which is mainly in the plasma membrane in the donor, we get this tenfold enhancement. In the acceptor, it has no effect. And other phosphoinositides have other similar asymmetric effects on either uh, transport to or from that membrane. Now, this led us back into now with the uh, enhanced computa computational available in 2015-2016 uh, to doing molecular dynamic studies in collaboration with other labs at uh, Weill Cornell Medical College. And we can now demonstrate a specific binding uh, at least in, in silico, of various phosphoinositides to specific residues on this protein. We've been able to now uh, do knockouts and, and, and uh, uh, sorry, uh, mutate specific amino acids and abrogate this phosphoinositide binding, reconstitute those in cells, and show that, in fact, they uh, dramatically affect the ability of this protein to transport sterol and dra dramatically affect the uh, sterol-dependent properties of those cells. So, uh, so now, in a way, we've become very much a sterile transport laboratory. And I just wanted to illustrate two uh, sort of diversions into uh, uh, applied or, or medically important aspects of, this, uh, of these, uh, of these uh, sterile dependent processes. And one of them is that there are rare inherited disease. There's a rare inherited disease called neiman pick c disease, which in, is involved in uh, mutations of either this transmembrane protein, NPC1, or NPC2, that are required to take sterol from lipoproteins and deliver it elsewhere in the cell. And we um, developed a, uh, a screen, an automated screening assay based on a dye that binds to philippin. Here's the way it accumulates in the mutant cells, and here's what it looks like in a wild-type cell. And the thing that makes this possible, and again, this is one of these things that changes over time, <coughs> 
Um, a graduate student at a microscope can do quantitative imaging on about 100 cells per day, and that's actually pushing it. The robot can easily do a million cells per day. So this 10 to the fourth or even 10 to the fifth uh, increase in, uh, in, in capability allowed us to do screens on 50,000 compounds by a mi microscopy-based screen. We got about 100 molecules that, uh, with, that were effective. Two of them, one of them we were able, able to identify as inhibiting the uh, hydrolysis of the lipoproteins. These others were ones that I would have never selected myself ab initio as having anything to do with lipid transport, our histone deacetylase inhibitors. But as you can see, if we uh, look at some of the uh, screening images, these are uh, wild type cells, these are mutant cells, and these are mutant cells treated with, uh, with uh, effective doses of a histone deacetylase inhibitor. And in collaboration with Bill Balch's lab at Scripps, we were able to uh, test these inhibitors on, uh, on, in this case, 82 different mutations. And all the ones in black are corrected by this histone deacetylase inhibitor, suggesting that this is uh, having a broad spectrum effect on multiple point mutations throughout this protein. And we think that this is actually related to changes in the proteostatic environment in the ER that's allowing these uh, mutant proteins to get out and to get into the late endosomes and lysosomes where they function. And this is something that I never expected to happen when I uh, started my career, is that we've actually gone on now, and uh, we have a clinical trial going on in collaboration with uh, Denny Porter at the NIH and Dan Ori at Washington University uh, to test the efficacy of these HDAC inhibitors that we discovered by this screen. And I want to say something now briefly about something else that we've, that's been alluded to throughout this meeting. This, uh, the community of neiman pick C disease researchers is quite small. It's a very rare disease. We, we actually just got the first NIH grant to actually study um, therapeutic uh, uh, aspects of, of treating this disease. But there's been a group of about 20 researchers that are su supported by uh, private foundations to the tune of about a million dollars a year collectively. And if you think about drug development programs, a million dollars a year over 10 or 15 years is nothing. But because this is a, a selected group of people that are dedicated to trying to work on this disease and know something about the general biology and share unpublished data freely amongst this group of 20 investigators, we actually have now two drugs in clinical trial for this disease. And I, and I think if this is uh, more or less, a, um, can be, I hope, a model for uh, this kind of research and, 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 and telling you the advantage of collaborations. But I have to tell you, these are very rigorous collaborations. Um, people that violate the principle of sharing unpublished data get thrown out of the group. Uh, people that we don't uh, trust the, uh, the reliability of their results, they, they don't get to continue in the group. And so, uh, so there's great value in collaboration. There's also great value, I think, in being very rigorous about your choice of collaborators. I'm just going to finish with a, a, a very uh, quick story about going from a very minor disease associated with cholesterol to a very major one. And this is, in fact, uh, um, atherosclerosis, which is uh, a major killer uh, uh, throughout the world. And the thing that we got interested here, and this goes back to our, our endocytic roots, is what, uh, what uh, macrophages encounter in the vessel wall is not soluble lipoproteins that can be taken in by clathrin mediated endo endocytosis. It's clumps of lipoproteins that are acted on by lipases and cross bridged to the extracellular matrix. And they, and they look like this. This is not something that could be tenocytosed or even phagocytosed. And so what we realized as we, as we tried to look in this at this is that, in fact, this is an extracellular hydrolysis, and it's, taking pl it's, it's, it's actually taking place uh, using a lysosomal enzyme. So this is very peculiar, and it's one of these things where you have to be uh, thinking outside the box. Uh, what, one of the things we did was to make pH measurements on these uh, large aggregates, and we found that in these extracellular domains, there was acidification, and I'm not going to show you the data, there was also lysosome secretion, but the idea of maintaining a, an acidic pH outside of the cell seems at first blush pretty bizarre. And we investigated this more, and we found that 
at the surface where a macrophage contacts this aggregated LDL, it makes this incredibly rich uh, network of actin-based uh, uh, processes. And <coughs> excuse me. Um, if we now use a technique that really just came available a few years ago called focused ion beam scanning electron microscopy, we can get EM data through uh, this entire interaction zone of the macrophage with the aggregated LDL. This is now color coding those compartments that contain this aggregate, which you can see is one continuous structure, but it goes from clearly outside the cell to areas clearly inside the cell in this deeply invaginated pocket. And if we look at this structure in detail now, we can see that in fact there are regions that are uh, nearly pinched off, but not pinched off, still continuous with the outside surface, outside world. And we think that these are the areas where uh, proton pumps and uh, lysosome acidification can actually create an extracellular lysosome-like compartment. And this is now a confocal microscopy image of this same kind of compartment, where again, the lipoprotein is going to be red, the surface of the cell is going to be gray, and uh, when, if I have time, the actin is going to be green. And you see this amazingly uh, net uh, branched uh, structure, which uh, is uh, surrounded by actin filaments, which we think are constricting on this area, forming tightened areas where uh, lysosome secretion uh, and, and proton pumping can create, create uh, hydrolytically active compartments. And actually, one of the fun things about traveling is when I was in Bangalore last week, uh, G2 and I realized that many of the signal transduction aspects of forming this compartment are not so different from aspects of the forming the click geek compartments that he's been studying. And so now we're exchanging reagents and, and, uh, and, and trying to understand what are the similarities and differences of these two different processes. So um, just going to, so really what, I, what I've tried to say in this last part is that studying from the idea of understanding cholesterol gets us into basic biology and to uh, various applied aspects of biology. And let me just finish by, uh, by reemphasizing this. I think I've showed you some example where things have changed enormously during my career. I think being multidisciplinary and thinking about cell biology as in a quantitative way at every step has been very important in developing unique areas of research. Uh, we've jumped around. I don't advise that, but if you like to do it, it's certainly uh, keeps uh, your career fun uh, and getting in, into new areas. Um, I think developing in uh, new technologies, and we're still doing this, I think it's so important. You, it, you, you know, it just keeps everything new and fresh and keeps you able to, uh, to keep loving what you're doing. And I can't have done any of this, of course, without the people who have done it over the years. And this is, a, I think, a complete list, but I've probably left off some. And I'd like to thank all of them because they're the people that actually did all this work. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. <laughs>